<laughs> Hello, friends. Before we start the show today, it's time to plug, plug, plug an upcoming Chapo live event. That's right. We are playing at the Pickathon Music Festival on Saturday, August 4th, just outside of beautiful Portland, Oregon. That's right. Chapo is at a music festival. Now, we have, we have, uh, I've heard personal testimony from everyone I've talked to, from uh, bands and uh, festival goers, that say that this is one of the best, genuinely one of the best music festivals in the country. A really fun and chill time. So if you're in the Pacific Northwest, or if you wanted to see it perform at a venue that's like sort of a modified barn, and if you want to see us perform inside the Wicker Man, please go to <laughs> pickathon.com and pick up your tickets. Uh, Chris, would you like to, I mean, obviously Chop a Trap House, it could be a pickathon, but who are some of the other artists that will be performing at this storied festival? I mean, I'm very excited to go to this because I'm a fan of music festivals. I go to music festivals and to get to play at one with such a great lineup, I'm very excited for. We've got uh, 90s indie rock icons built to spill. We've got the Jizza playing with, I believe, genius, a live the genius, band. the genius yes. of the Wu-Tang Clan. I believe playing with uh, like a live band that he plays with, which sounds really good. Uh, oh God, like l- Liquid Swords with live musical accompaniment with an yeah. orchestra. I mean, come on. That's worth the price of admission right there. Uh, UK buzz band, Wet Leg, TV Priest, uh, Gorilla Toss, and Operator Music Band. I've seen both of those two bands here in New York. They both rock. The new Gorilla Toss album is fucking awesome. Uh, Faye Webster, Goth Babe, I really like. Uh, my good friends over at the Off Book podcast will be there as well. If you want to see a podcast that's like the exact polar opposite of Chapo, but also very, very funny. They're an improvised musical uh, podcast. I, I, le- I learned about Wet Leg through, uh, through Chris Wade. We incorporated Wet Leg into our sort of like, uh, like I don't know, ho- like waiting music before we go on stage at one of our live shows. If you come saw us on our latest live tour, you probably heard some Wet Leg. Uh, to all I will say about Wet Leg is went to school and got the big D. That's what Absolutely. it's all about, folks. It's getting the big D. So that's pickathon.com for tickets. Um, the whole festival will also be streamed live over a good fr- with frequency for like $10. You can see basically everything streaming live. If you can't make it to the Pacific Northwest, there will, that'll also be that. Uh, and finally, if a uh, festival is not your vibe, I will say that we are also looking, still looking to book another show in the Portland area around that time. However, nothing is solidified. So if you want to be guaranteed to see us in uh, or around Portland in August, as of right now, it's pickathon.com. Grab your tickets. See you there. Barring monkeypox and explosions, of course. <laughs> God. <laughs> Chaz, too. We're starting it in Portland, Oregon. Come be there. Come be part of the movement. All right. Let, let's start the show. Hello, babies. It's the Big Chapo here. It's a Monday, May twenty third. Sorry, I've been. Uh, I was just watching Big Bopper videos all weekend, and I'm just. It's, it's time for the Big Bopper to come back. The Big Bopper fan community is dying. Please like and support the Big Bopper and Chantilly Lace. You know he's got a few other uh, bangers. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's a couple of B sides there in that catalog that could really blow your mind if you gave him a chance. Uh, other songs about different kinds of women's underwear that uh, just drive <laughs> me crazy, baby. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the Big Popper was really he was sort of like the original DJ Khaled because he was a big dumb goofball who was you know a <laughs> DJ but not really who got famous for saying things on on a yep. song just talking <laughs> and then and then getting killed alongside more talented people <laughs> I, okay, I, gotta, was, I actually do think that you know as much as chantilly lace a bop as we would all agree as much as it's part of the, the 50s tapestry of, of popular music i think he would be less remembered if he was just the guy who did Chantilly Lace and not the guy who died in a plane crash with Buddy Holly and Richie Valens. I feel like I've always I've always identified with Peter Boyle's X-Files character in that I was always more of a fan of the Big Bopper than Buddy Holly. And ever since that moment, I've been able to predict the future and I can do nothing to change it. I can do I can see what's coming exactly, but can do nothing to alter uh, the future. That is my curse. But it's one I'm happy to share with you guys on the show here. And uh, speaking of uh, predicting the future. Uh, cursed or otherwise friends it's been a long we spent a long time uh doing what i feel like is just you know shrieking into the darkness to to no avail no one's paying attention Uh, no one's willing to step up and follow our advice well 
that time is over. Somebody up there is finally listening to us. What am I referring to? Yes, Eric Adams' 2024 presidential bid. It's real. It's happening. We were right. Uh, I can't can't wait for to this train to leave the station. I love firing up the lathe of heaven again. <laughs> Feels good. Uh, this is according to the New York Post. Eric has told me repeatedly that he thinks he has a platform to run for national office for president in 2024. He has said that repeatedly. He thinks that New York is a national platform. He thinks the national party has gotten too far left, and he thinks he has a platform to win. Uh, this is the, now this is contingent on Joe Biden not running or not seeking a second term, but. Uh, there was another article out this weekend about how he was in D.C. National Democrats are, are basically courting him to help with uh, a national communication strategy. And if there's one person who can do it, it's the mayor of New York City. He's the man. He's He knows that we need a vibe shift. He knows that that is the most important thing. I mean, and if he thought that the special deposit of gems and minerals under New York <laughs> gave it a special energy and a vibe... Imagine when he finds out what Washington D.C. is buried. Oh in. my goodness! Uh, is Eric Adams aware that the the the, the street plan layout of Washington D.C. is a pentagram? Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to make him aware of that fact. It's, now, it's but, on but, ley lines. There's <laughs> yes. like orphan bones under there. I'm getting a special energy from this pet cemetery. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, but like, uh, you know, I, I, I saw over the weekend, like a lot of people were saying like, oh, like, you know, Eric Adams, like the D- Democratic uh, National Communications Strategist. I was like, th- everyone was saying basically people who um, would have gotten that job otherwise are just saying like, this is clown shit. Like, can you believe how stupid the Democrats are? It's like, well, uh, A, like, oh, sorry, you didn't get the job, buddy. Uh, but like out of anyone who would have want to or conceivably be qualified to do that awful, stupid job. Is there anyone better than Eric Adams? Because like I, no. I don't see that. I don't see them walking through that door. As we've discussed, New York City is like the third most powerful executive office in the United States, and that means it's functionally identical to president, and it, that means it's equally powerless. It's equally a figurehead <laughs> position, and it's equally there for someone to absorb the public's anger and also to just provide some sort of narrative to explain what's exactly happening, and. Joe Biden's is he's on screen at the Soylent uh, Green Factory talking to <laughs> Edward G. Robinson. And, you know, I don't think uh, maybe people thought that was preferable to Trump, you know, driving the, the fucking uh, plane into the building. But I think they'd rather have I think at this point, everyone's like, yeah, we'd rather have some illusions, please, that there's some future here. And who can do that better than the man who is so just psychopathically confident and sure of himself? That there's no way that that wouldn't spill over into all of us and the way we think of our country. Um, like my, my like my best pitch for why this this does make sense, despite uh, how it appears on the surface, is that like uh, like like as a, as a national candidate or a national communications guru, uh, he has two things to recommend himself in terms of communicating with like the American public at large. Uh, one is he doesn't seem to be online at all. Or really like have any idea about that's true like, online social media discourse or like that's uh, the, the confidence tweets thing. or takes of not, the day he's not having like, to, he doesn't compulsively have to put a dipstick in to see how he's coming across like Kamala Harris which is what ruins her yeah uh, number two and probably most importantly of all he's not online but he is also a genuine genuine weirdo yeah yep, <laughs> like, yep. I'll just, I mean we need we've, we've proven pretty conclusively that what we really want is is something you know like joe biden is the last will probably be the last ever president who just represented like the democratic party it's all going to be personalities now and and like fragments of a personality and so you know you're either someone who people have already proven they love because of your charisma because you're a famous person like donald trump for example or you're just so fucking freaky that you are magnetic that people want to look at you because they just are amazed that someone like you exists and they want to see what you're going to get up to next yeah and like you know like i mean obviously like like his thing is like oh like the national party has gotten too far left wing and i'm the antidote to that but like i mean like again it's not really about like uh 
who's more left wing or not or has the party gone too far like no no, no like nobody, nobody cares about that that's like that's a, that's not how voters think like the the average moderate voter has like one or two genuinely left wing beliefs and one or two like insanely right wing beliefs and then everything in between is just a mishmash of what other people tell them but like yeah. eric adams is like okay a um the energy crystals underneath the island of manhattan fact uh, his, his belief that Gracie Mansion is haunted and that there are quote ghosts creeping around there. <laughs> that, he said that. I spent an hour last night in my bedroom <laughs> talking to Phil LaGuardia, and he's been dead for fifty years. <laughs> okay, and then I just like this is just one other thing. Uh, I was like, uh, not funny because there was another uh, horrific murder on the New York City subway uh, this weekend. Some guy just got like randomly just shot like so some insane person just like going across the Manhattan Bridge. Uh, his statement on this killing says, it is my responsibility to keep New Yorkers safe. My heart goes out to that family. I'm sorry they lost their loved one. I thank God I'm the mayor right now. <laughs> Which is, that's, that's, that's really what a grieving family wants to hear. It's oh just like, God. can you imagine if some other guy was mayor right now? Yeah, it's like, it's, what do you want to be though? Like if crime is going to be going up in American cities, do you want to be the one who's there uh, trying to, uh, like say no, it's actually fine. You know, we're gonna uh, we're gonna do something to fix it. Or the guy who's just gonna like be like fucking uh, He Man, just going to take it upon himself, like fucking Charles Bronson, and he could then be like on your behalf, like your frustration, and and he could be your he could be your hero, baby. He's a, he is you know he is a genuine streetwise Hercules, and Indeed. that's what, that, that's what the, that's what the country needs right now. So like I said. Uh, I'm not going to be voting for him, but, you know, like, it's it just finally our advice is being heeded. The vibe shift is happening and most people are weirdos, but they can't like you. Uh, th that weirdness, it can't be mediated by like like an online point of view. Like that, that's, no. that's, for, yeah, that's for a different. That's, kind. That, that, that's that's mind poison that that fills you with uh, self-doubt. And that's what gets you to go away from your true, authentic weirdness, which is what people relate to and tack towards. Uh, you know the uh, uh, the party line, the stuff that feels fraudulent, like the stuff people know. Oh, you got that from the internet. You got that yeah. from a focus group. That's not your real freak flag flying. And so, yeah, like we need people who are fully so confident, so supernaturally sure of themselves that they have burned their social media ships and are just going off into the fucking wilderness by themselves. Before we move on from Eric Adams, can I relay? one other Eric Adams story. Yeah. Which is apparently he was at the opening of a new hard rock restaurant in Times Square, you know, the hard rock cafe. What? Uh, They're opening yeah. one now in yes, Times Square? Like a huge, yeah, like a huge complex. There was a big party there and the New York magazine set their party reporter there. And that person got uh, stuck in an elevator with Eric Adams. Not stuck, but was ended up in an elevator with Eric Adams and asked for a uh, statement on it. And he just uh, looked the reporter in the eye and said, I love the hard rock. <laughs> Uh, yeah, for, for those about to hard rock, we salute you. Uh, we salute New York City. We salute Times Square and, and, it, and it's hard rock loving mayor. I mean, wasn't he, wasn't he like, oh, oh yeah, there was like partying. Was that, wasn't he was partying with, uh, Cara, uh, Delevingne or whatever her name yes. is, you know, yeah, like the, the credit crazy. card party. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Who was she like grinding on the other day? People. She, she, she's out of pocket. She, she's, uh, gone yeah, ham. she like, she was like doing some like model bullshit to Megan the Stallion. Like she, uh, Megan the Stallion was taking a picture in like a complicated dress, and Cara Delevingne was like, "Oh, I'm a model. I know how to like flip the flappy part, the tail of the dress." And then every everyone was making fun of her, uh, be presumably because she was like wearing glasses. It kind of made her look like a creature. But um, that that was that was the thing you're thinking of. Presumably, presumably it. she's like horny, horny for Megan the Stallion. Which like who is know, it? Who can? Who is it? I honestly think her. what's who happening is that she's she is doing serious method acting preparation for the upcoming spin-off film about the Enchantress, our favorite character from <laughs> Suicide Squad. Finally. The character we love more than any other character. Everyone after that movie was like, I gotta get more of that Enchantress. <laughs> was everyone's like, Why has it been so long? There's been a whole other Suicide Squad movie, no Enchantress. Be patient, folks. This thing is gonna be I believe it's uh it's going to be Marvel's, or I'm sorry, it's going to be uh, DC's uh, biggest budget ever, $800 million. Uh, it's going to be three separate films released at the same time, each of them three hours long. 
Enchantress, folks. Get ready for it. <laughs> well, yeah, that was the character that everyone fell in love with. They're like, I love the bitch who's dirty all the time. <laughs> yes, super the lady is, pig pen. Super <laughs> power, super, super power is that she's is the same same quality of like a a girl who goes to Rizdi's bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, God, I'll never forget. Like from the the you know the canonical Suicide Squad episode, Matt. Like when you said when you saw that movie in theater, and and like the big climax at the end, where Enchantress is doing like a luau dance She's with all her magic. Coming, <laughs> he's doing like a hula. Clearly a CGI I, body. <laughs> and you just said out loud in the theater, awful, <laughs> awful. Yep. But just then of course, I'll, that, that yeah. And brutal. then I'll, I'll I'll also remember from the Suicide. I, I think it, basically at about that same same moment in the movie. Um, I had given Felix an edible before we saw the movie. I think it was the last time Felix ever did um, marijuana of any kind. But he just turns yeah. to me and he's like, I, I can't take this. <laughs> this, is, this Donald, is, I'm, I'm, Donald, yeah. Donald Trump won because of that. <laughs> yeah, he, um, got, uh, yeah. he got depressed that he doesn't live in the universe that has Enchantress in it. Yeah, I tried to like, find my like own the- Enchantress. <laughs> after, after I saw it, I was just wandering the East Village looking for the dirtiest woman possible. <laughs> I ended up, I ended up like do, doing what Hunter Biden did and having like a crust bunk live with me for four <laughs> years. Every, every young and man, I still I still have like a dreadlock growing out of my back, <laughs> <laughs> connected every, with my spinal cord. Every man who moves to uh, Brooklyn is just looking for his enchantress. That's right. That's the that's the dream. Just the dirtiest, grubbiest lady in town, mm. but powerful. I mean, you're 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 in luck. Because, um, look, if you're if you're with a woman in Brooklyn, she, her genetic memories are gonna awaken, and she will her Cro Magnon DNA will activate, and if you successfully mate with her, she she will give you the most oxidized water in the world, nice uh, room temperature water that's been on her nightstand for seven years. That stuff gains power though. The longer it's there, yeah, women love that. Women yeah. love just having the most like air bubbled water ever. They also love opening uh, uh, carbonated beverages and not finishing them. Yeah. Oh, ladies, come on, come on. Yeah, women uh, no, like I- it. When, women like it when the like fish with hind legs that started humanity crawls out of a Lacroix. <laughs> uh, also, uh, average woman has a ten thousand dollar line of credit at Sephora. Enchantress, never even heard of uh, lotions or you know various balms and uh, pastes, and I don't know what else they sell it for. But ladies, it's expensive. It's a fucking uh, you know, for for lotion. Come on, get out of here. We all need an enchantress. Let's get enchanted. Let's get let's get that dirty magic going. You need a moisturizer for when you wash your face. But if you're never washing because you're just writhing around in dirt magic all the time, <laughs> you don't, don't really need that, do you? Nope. There's no German dream. There's no French dream, there's no Polish dream, but there's an American dream. And so when you leave here today, you leave here with that dream, and you can go from being a dishwasher to owning a restaurant. You can go from being a person who has dyslexic and become the mayor. As long as you dream, as long as you fight for what you think is right, this country will become the country we want it to be. And in the process, there's going to be a lot of people who will hate you. All I can say, have your haters become your waiters when you sit down at the table of success. Thank you. All right. So uh, moving up from uh, from Eric Adams and the Enchantress, this is like, you know, like uh, we're checking in on all our old favorites, all our old friends are coming back. I would like to talk now briefly about uh, our friends. Uh, you know, I mean, look, we tried to pursue a sponsorship deal with them, you know, do the ad reads, but it fell through at the last moment. Black Rifle Coffee Company. They're back in the news, folks. And uh, they're back in the news for a rather uh, rather eye-popping reason. And uh, that is according to, like, um, uh, a recent allegation of uh, securities fraud. I did Security not realize fraud. this. The, the, uh, the, the, the Black Rifle Coffee Company became, uh, like, public, like, uh, you know, publicly traded company. And the Black Rifle Coffee Company was... Uh, a valuation of seven point three billion dollars. Uh, That's a lot it, of coffee. And it says like uh, it apparently it posted four million dollars of net income in twenty twenty, and a loss <laughs> of fourteen, and a loss of fourteen million dollars last year. That that's that price. I don't know much, but I know the word price to earnings ratio, and I know that's not a good one. 
So when I first, uh, but I mean, probably better than Tesla, honestly. <laughs> well, te- Teslas were at one point two hundred, which is like that. That's kind of like the financial equivalent of building the Tower to Babel. Yeah, no, it was it's, when it was hitting a thousand dollars a share right before. Uh, I think he started doing the try to buy uh, to try to buy Twitter thing to knock some actual cash out of this fucking uh, thing while it's still possible. And now he might have pulled the Django Tower apart. We'll see. Yeah, he's about um, 10 points away from a margin call mm-hmm. on the loans against the uh, equity. So if you're out there uh, and, you know, your Tesla explodes, please let people know just to see yeah. what happens. Because this is this has already been awesome. I know this is about purple black. <laughs> no, no, coffee, yeah. but I, like, oh, but I really exactly. want to talk about it's all, like, yeah, him. It's all the it's same used, phenomenon, yeah. you know? Yeah. It scams all the way down. All yeah. I mean, like, because they gave they gave the government gave them all this money and said here invest it and it's like sure we'll invest it in fucking what there's no productive <laughs> there's nothing generating profit anymore so they just have to sit on it and then fake it until they don't even have to make it as long as the know, money pump keeps going. Uh, say what you'll about uh, Black Rifle Coffee Company, but you know no one who has ever uh, brewed themselves a cup of Black Rifle Coffee has found themselves trapped in the coffee machine as it catches on fire and kills them. I mean, the founders of the company have done that to people, but not of their coffee. Not yeah, their coffee. Yeah. No, no, that yeah, the coffee literally makes you on the other end of that. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you able to do that to women and children. But I, uh, I mean, I gotta say, I'm. I will get to Black Rifle, but like. I am loving Mr. Cap's wild ride. <laughs> he destroyed his life. He destroyed his like people have done like all types of people who have done this, who have had like most of their net worth tied up in equity in a company they control have like done this where it's like, oh, I'm going to like sell it to go into this private enterprise or like borrow against it. But they haven't like destroyed their lives two weeks later. Yeah. Well, it's because of because he had this bind where he couldn't start. He couldn't just sell the the, the stock. Because that undermines his brand, which is the entirety of the value of the fucking thing in the first place. So that's why he had to do this smoke and mirrors bullshit with Twitter to try to like do a three card money game and sneak money out of Tesla without anybody noticing. But now it's completely falling apart. Yeah, because yeah. he had to be the face of it the whole time, and uh, he's not that fucking smart. At the end of the day, no, he's he's Robert De Niro hosting Aces High. <laughs> You could have you could have had the fucking cash for equity, but you had to be yeah. on fucking TV. You had to you had to post your own groiper. You had to be based. They can't fuck around with me if I'm based. Not like they would a, a, a soy guy. We talked to the guys back home in the Emerald Mine. They think you gone bad shit. Yeah, uh, you know I got like uh, the the, kind of, the the Mustang is incredible though because like. Um, uh, seeing seeing the defenses of what is alleged here, like the, the number of people who are just like, uh, like OK, uh, first of all, uh, he has Asperger's. So like he just probably just, you know, misunderstood social cues with that stewardess or whatever. And it's just like, yeah, like, oh, yeah, an autistic person would never sexually harass someone. I mean, that's that's literally never happened. But also, but also, also like also like the idea that like people like guys with Asperger's are just like constantly walking around in bathrobes being like, hey, baby, want to suck it? Yeah, (laughs) not not just like not just like missing every cue from women who are also at a Naruto convention. (laughs) Like uh, it's it's a comprehensively great defense. The Musk dick riders are out in full force. Did you see the guy who was like Elon Musk showed you his wiener and you're complaining? Yes, yes. Oh they're like, he, they're like, he was like, I just don't understand women. This is the richest man in the world. And then like the weirdest thing is that the guy said he was like, I just don't understand women. If the richest man in the world exposes himself to you, like, wouldn't you want to tell all your friends how big his dick was? Yeah. <laughs> Even if it wasn't, they'd have to believe you. <laughs> it's, what? Oh, and and then and then Musk was just like, he was just like, I challenge anyone to name five fucked up things about my dick. Uh, you can't because <laughs> it's all a made up. And it's just like, dude, like how how weird would your dick have to be for like someone to like pick pick out a distinguishing feature about it? They're like, it's, I don't know, cut or uncut. Those are the options that you can guess uh, on that. But yeah, the, Felix, the, the, the dick riding that's going on with Elon Musk right now, and I don't even mean like the people defending him against a, you know, sexual harassment allegation. I mean, the people who talk about him, like he's Albert Einstein. 
And, you know, I know this is a little cliche or some might say hyperbolic, but when I see shit like that, I truly understand what it must have been like to witness the rise of Adolf Hitler. You know, like you're, you're in Germany in the 30s and you're like, can you believe this fucking clown? How many people take him seriously? And then like 10 years later, you're freezing to death on the Eastern Front. Well, yeah, yeah, but it's like it's like if Hitler like lied about being in World War One, <laughs> if he like lied, if he like lied about being like he was never there, and then like his supporters were like, well, he like you know he like drove an ambulance that was outside the war. He founded the he founded the war by like buying it five years after it started. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's like. It's like like if, if Hitler's supporters like never shut up about him being a good artist. <laughs> yeah like I, actually actually he's a much better painter than picasso yeah he actually had a really promising art career and he like gave it up to like solve the jew problem <laughs> yeah they, they let him into the art school and he just decided not to go yeah he was too base for art yeah and uh felix uh you pointed this out the other day uh we didn't get a chance to talk about it but like obviously everyone is um uh, like the, you know the allegations of uh uh cajoling a woman into giving you a hand job by buying her a pony but, like, elides the weirder detail in this that, like, uh, you brought up, which is that apparently all SpaceX stewardesses were um, pressured to get a masseuse license on their own dime so that they could give mas- massages to uh, SpaceX executives. Oh, uh, who, who does that remind me of? That's right. Another great scientist, Robert Oppenheimer, who <laughs> just just like Elon Musk. No, it Wait is so the, literally I, the Ghislaine modus operandi. He's, he's, he's taking... Uh... He's taking the Lolita Express uh, uh, interstellar. It's like yep. he pressed the button and the Lolita Express turns into a space shuttle. He's extending that is the, the thing I'm a little confused about here. She's a SpaceX flight attendant. Yeah. Does that mean that she's like a, uh, she's a flight attendant on a plane that goes into space? No. Or is that just what they call their like, fleet of private jets yes. or something? Yes. If this way, if this worked, he would have com- he would have claimed he invented the Lolita Express. Like that would have been another thing that he stole and lied about. He's extending I the just, light, extending the light of human trafficking into the cosmos. <laughs> yeah, I like that that it's like a a stewardess who's presumably like in a one bedroom apartment like one day a week, and he's like, oh, what if I got you a horse? <laughs> <laughs> he's just like putting your fucking pantry. Awesome, dude. What, like what is it with these guys and getting massages it's like it's like it's like i don't know like a, a certain kind of like uh rich guy like why do they think that like getting them it, it's like getting a massage like i mean like that like that that's the perfect uh that's the that, that's the perfect way to ex- uh, escalate you know like a sexual relationship with a woman like getting a fucking massage i don't like, because, just, have, like, well, okay. like all the like the last porn they saw that had adults in it was like soft core from 1987 they, they, they all get the same manual or something. It really is like written by Jelena. I think it's, it's like they're basically like their attempt to sexually dominate is just an extension of their you know relationship to everyone they interact with. A, a power dynamic defined by them being the purchaser of their labor, right? Be it like waiters or drivers or chauffeurs or anybody. This is just the most intimate one of those, right? Like they're actually touching your body. So that means it's the shortest jump to, hey, grab my dick. Hey, let's do something sexual. It's the, it's the smallest amount of escalation necessary to take that like uh, relationship and extend it into like physical exploitation, which is what they get off on. Getting, having sex is boring. Having sex when someone doesn't want to have it, that's mm. also an example of your power, and that makes it more intense. They're sickos, folks. These people are sick. Yeah, but it just also, it's also like, you know, the least creative like showtime scenario well yes they're also absolute dullards i mean that's the other that's the thing it's like this it's the path of least resistance yeah the only yeah the only it's like the only non-porn stuff they've watched it's yeah like a movie starring shannon tweed and they're like oh that's all good <laughs> that's how that's how i like fuck a woman intimate encounters yeah <laughs> red shoe diaries I, I fucking hate Teslas, man. Like, I'd never been in one until we were in Austin, but, like, I've never felt less safe being in a car because, like, they're, like, I don't think that, like, exiting, an, like, an automobile should have, like, the same feel as, like, trying to, like, I don't know, open an app on my phone or it's just, like, the Bluetooth yeah. isn't connecting or something. Like, I saw a thing, I saw a thing today or yesterday since that, like, Tesla blew up that was, like, um, oh, actually, there, there, like, is an escape hatch for the Tesla. There's, like, a manual escape hatch. It's behind the secondary speaker, and you just you just have to like 
solve a co- uh, solve a puzzle that has a rage comic in it <laughs> while your car is filling with smoke to get out. Uh, they're 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 bad. They're bad folks, and everyone who drives them are equally bad. But yeah, like uh, just just expect a Black Rifle Coffee Company recently. Uh, so like. Uh, basically, like uh, th- this came to light. This came to light because uh, a guy, basically, like uh, this guy. I'm looking at this thing. It says 1791 management sends letter to Black Rifle Coffee Company demanding they brew up an action plan to address serious allegations of corporate governance failures and code of conduct violations. And uh, the letter was written by this guy named uh, Jonathan uh, Valentine, who basically, like, I, he seems like um like a crank who writes letters to, to companies that he owns shares in or something like that. But he may be right in this case. Um, uh, just a brief thing about, <laughs> about Jonathan. Uh, he, he wrote another letter to a California solar powered company named Heliogen. And uh, he uh, is he's sort of a, he claims that he has a degree in what is known as pure mathematics, um, which is not a distinction. That's that, scale math. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not a distinction that his uh, alma mater makes uh, he's a pure mathematics expert but you know this guy Valentine Valentine may be onto something he says dear Mr. Evan Hafer uh, this is the, the CEO of Black Rifle Coffee Company I regrettably must communicate with you via this public forum because as of recently it appears you have decided to cease all communications with us 1791 Management LLC manages certain entities that hold Black Rifle Coffee Company shares please do not confuse our stake as a vote of confidence in the company's leadership on the contrary in just three months of being a public company in our opinion you have caused significant harm to your shareholders and military veterans it is our belief that you may be one of the most dangerous CEOs in America We have conducted a thorough review of your company, including actions by management and reviews of your SEC filings. Combining this with our numerous conversations with Black Rifle lawyers and executives, we have uncovered what we believe to be the most harrowing strategy to line your pockets at the expense of others. And yes, Chief Legal Counsel and Corporate Secretary Mr. Andrew McCormick, it was us on the phone as you cavalierly described what I would consider a plan to screw over your public shareholders as set forth in more detail below. It is our conclusion that your profiteering at the expense of Americans under the guise of helping military veterans reveals your shameless disregard for our most honorable citizens. Furthermore, we believe your actions as CEO reveals a pattern of gross negligence and dereliction of duty that can expose the company to a tsunami of litigation, which we believe your public shareholders deserve to be made aware of. I'm just skipping ahead here to the end of uh, this uh, this open letter that Mr. Uh, Wallentine has read. He says here, on a deeply personal level, adding insult to injury, my own military veteran father is one of your victims. Okay, this this is one of my favorite types of guys. Um, the, yeah. the the children of veterans who are stealing their own parents' military valor because their dad served in the Cold War. Well, this guy, this guy's like a hedge fund manager, right? Which, first of all, if you're a hedge fund manager who took a position in Black Rifle, like, I mean, who are you crying to? You really, you really wrote your own tragedy here. But if he's a hedge fund manager, his dad served in like the Spanish American War. <laughs> his dad like got to take doubloons home from the war. I'm not really like sad for him. Uh, so yeah, he says here. Um, unlike it goes. Uh, my own military veteran father is one of your victims. Unlike you, though, he served his country with honor. He has a CIB and was awarded a Purple Heart, Bronze Star Medal, Army Commendation Medal, Air Medal, and lost his leg. <laughs> I, I, don't hear a, I, I don't hear a combat medal in there, so that just means he had an accident or he has diabetes. Yeah, he had, yeah like, uh, you can get a Purple Heart for, you know, doing some shit to yourself, like walking into a, a trench accidentally, breaking your leg. Mm-hmm. Sounds like it sounds like he was a victim of the great soldier Sarah Lee. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like she took another American life. After hearing your story about supporting veterans, he purchased Black Rifle stock and subsequently lost 60% of his value. Now he dubs you Crooked Hafer and would love nothing more than to see you exposed for the criminal he believes you to be. Odds are what a any- bad dad. <laughs> he like uh, this fucking oaf who like lost his leg by accident while serving in Frankfurt, Germany is like is like, hey, I know you're busy with your hedge fund, but could you like take over the coffee company that I, I like lost my war bonds in? I lost my war <laughs> bond interest in because like I, I felt some kinship with him as a veteran. Can you just make this the entire focus instead of being Bobby Axelrod? <laughs> My dad served in the bonus army. Uh, he goes, <laughs> now he dubs you Crooked Hafer. I mean, what, I mean, again, just, just, just ripping off Trump. I mean, very, very low energy there. 
a uh, crooked heifer and would love nothing more than to see you exposed for the criminal he believes you to be. Odds are that any money Black Rifle donated to military veterans is much less than what they probably lost in your stock. Personally, I'd be fearful if I were you. Executives have gone to jail for breaking securities laws. Really? Like, Not really recent, anymore. Recently? Like, <laughs> no. I don't, when was the last time that happened? Black Tuesday? Yeah, like en Enron is like the <laughs> last one I can think of. I mean, they, they said the Quest Communications guy to jail, but that was more because he wouldn't just like give the NSA tons of metadata. He closes the letter by saying, what I'm about to say may seem a bit harsh, Mr. Hafer, but I, I just said with some authority, if you don't plan on responding to my letter and are promptly preparing an action plan, then I believe it's best you wind down Black Rifle Coffee, return what public money is left on the company's balance sheet, and retreat to whatever bunker you came out of to do what you do best, donate money to the Democratic Party and smear conservatives as racists. The irreparable damage I believe your greed likely caused shareholders will never be repaid. We, and veterans like my father, former customers and shareholders, must hold you accountable for any further exploitation of Americans for your personal gain. Very truly yours, Jonathan Wallentine. So. Oh, so, okay, okay. So this is, I was afraid for a second that this guy was a woke capitalist. <laughs> no, anti, no, yeah. This is an anti-woke <laughs> yes. hedge fund. Okay, okay. I take everything back. Um, yeah, I think you'll remember from like, this is, I don't know, like last year or something, like uh, the Evan Hafer guy, he had to do some press because his coffee was becoming, and uh, coffee and their merchandise was becoming popular among sort of, uh, I don't know, like white nationalists want to be paramilitary. So he was just like, hey, can we chill on all the politics? And just, 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 just yeah. by, just, can you just enjoy a, a Sig Sour dark roast or, you know, like, a <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I remember that. He, yeah. yeah he, he was like, hey, guys, can we take it from a, from a groiper down to a Pepe? <laughs> Go down one frog here, guys. Well, I mean, shit. Like, I mean, he still got a, he still got a $7.3 billion valuation on his company. And when I first read the story, I was like, God damn. I was like, how do you fuck up running a coffee company that bad? You're selling an addictive product that like most American adults use daily. But the thing is, like, I, I, I got it wrong because like, like he this is the opposite of fucking up. Like he, he's killing it and, and and looting and taking money from veterans. So, I mean, shit, like what could be better? Well, the, so the guy's saying that he cheated veterans because like the stock went down, <laughs> which it like, holy shit. Veterans cry about like everything. It's a bit like they think they think that they need they deserve like an FDIC where they never lose money on the stock market. It's incredible. <laughs> well, they serve they well, they yeah. served our country, Felix. Yeah, okay. you're the dumbass who thought, oh, a uh, troop branded coffee is going to someday compete with fucking Starbucks because of how much everyone loves the troops. So they're going to want to drink their coffee like a fucking child thinks something like that. That's not their fault that you believed it. Well, yeah, and Starbucks is the troop branded coffee. Exactly. It's like they've got everything. This is a niche product for fucking political dorks uh, and tryhards. And the idea, and so once you see it get a certain point, you shouldn't expect, oh, that's going to just keep going up, up, up. You should think, let me get out as soon as possible, which is why I can't really fault the CIA CEO dude. Like if you, you're just watching as people keep bidding up this fucking stock price and you're still just a fucking coffee company that has like, cool names for the brand like you know uh, uh, a civilian massacre <laughs> dark roast or whatever the fuck and you think that's cool you're gonna get out of suit you want to get the money out because you know it's not gonna last so what else are you supposed to do just go I, down I, with the ship for no reason yeah i knew I, I knew it was a bad sign for black rifle coffee company when like they tried to you know sort of uh, branch out with their uh me lie macchiatos and you yeah. know it just didn't it didn't catch on Eddie Gallagher was probably drinking Starbucks from the forward <laughs> operating base when he did all that stuff. Yeah. Like, I people, mean, he probably like, yeah. he probably like, you know, now like what he probably has his own coffee company. Right. I'm assuming. Cause it's just, it's just all like the Navy seal in their natural habitat is to, they, they create a company they can embezzle from. So he's probably doing that. But when he I, was in it, when he made his name, I know what he was drinking. I uh, remember like the episode we did about the Navy SEALs where there were like three different guys who wrote three different books all claiming that they, they capped Bin Laden. 
I'm like, I would like all three of those guys to start competing coffee companies, like attacking each other over like, you know, like, uh, uh, yeah, like uh, their 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 medium Colombian blend uh, is, is that's lies. I, I'm the one who uh, secured secured the beans from uh, uh, you know uh, Guatemala or whatever. This is unrelated, but do you remember the the post 9/11 rumor about Caribou Coffee, where people were like, "Oh, they like they give all their profits to Hamas." <laughs> Wait, no, I, I don't not, that. That's funny. <laughs> that was I. Th- I don't know who started that. That's honestly that might have been like specific to. That might have just been like like insane like North Shore Zionists. Wait a second. Wait a second. Thought that. Wait a second. Caribou Coffee. I own stock in Caribou Coffee. I'm writing a letter to the CEO of Hamas right now, demanding to know <laughs> yeah. what they've spent this money on because these Katusha rockets, they're not getting the job done. All right. Yeah. My dad served at the Lot <laughs> Airport. That was a different group. I know. Don't correct me. <laughs> just take that out. I said the wrong. I said the wrong thing. Uh, <laughs> I was I always thought that was funny just because it's like the fact that everyone knew about it, like that they're saying that in like their shareholder reports. Oh, we we donated uh three hundred million dollars to Hamas this year. Um, yeah, but yeah, I, I guess just like uh the, the theme for you know, like I said, it's just scams and frauds all the way down. Like there there there, there is there is no going concern in America that makes money anymore that isn't isn't a massive securities fraud in one way or another mm-hmm. it's got it's, it's got to be right like i mean it's just yeah well yeah we're trying to hide the the fact that this uh expansionary engine that's supposed to be undergirding this economy has in a real way shut down that those the, those places that are dynamic are no longer in america we're just there to consume i mean that's why like you know the real nerd visionaries love to talk about you know like a ubi deal where you're just like look we need to recognize that America is just a consumer economy, literally. That's what we're here to do. And then just direct the economy to give us money to consume things and not expect us to go through the hoops of trying to create, uh, you know, productive economic enterprises because we, we no longer need to. It's inefficient. Let people do it elsewhere. And then we just sit here and consume. But our our values, our culture, our politics just cannot metabolize the implications of that so we have to keep pretending we have an economy yeah and i think for like the, the progressive visionaries you know like 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 andrew yang or things like that i mean i, I think we see the writing on the wall was just like how much of this country's population is just unnecessary to whatever is left of the economy so like i mean like if you're a progressive uh you know of a progressive mindset you're just like well uh, just, just, just pay them off, and then, but like, but also, like, that'll be the justification for just like absolutely shit canning like every other function of the state. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You make the state it get it writes checks, and then you get to use those checks in a fully marketized social structure, without any any uh, uh, democratically accountable interaction at all. Like no no institutions that even theoretically answer to people who are not paying customers. I mean, sounds pretty grim, but. I have an idea for like a tangible thing. It, it's tangible. It's a real business. It's it's physical even, and it helps children. Are you guys ready to hear it? Spit idea. We need more right wing YA literature. <laughs> we need we need to be getting younger audiences before the left does, and then pretend that I have like a little picture of like a frog uh, reading to other frogs. Good night, friend. Yeah, I just I saw that post today, and it's like, damn, all Americans are soy. It's Triple true. AS. We it really is just like that. Everyone just is the same asshole. It used to be like, oh, like this person is you know you, but like you took like three left turns to end up where you did. But now it's just like it's a complete mirror match. Like it's going to be dueling shitty YA genres. Uh, yeah, my comment on that is that I'm volunteering my services as an insensitivity reader to any YA author. I will, <laughs> I will edit and vet your manuscript to make sure it's properly racist and based enough. I'm a ba- I'm a based <laughs> insensitivity reader, and I, I can't wait till the, I can't wait till the, the the based YA genre starts, and then they all just start absolutely cutting each other's throats immediately, as 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 happened in the in the in the I guess the the woke YA genre. Yeah, the author of the Groiper games, like it's a, he has to issue an apology because he has a Jewish grandparent. 
Yeah. Or like, just I'm like, I'm so you know, sorry. I thought I could, I thought I could like, you know, absolve my family's sins with my work, but I should, I need to take accountability. Or like, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the guy who's written the, uh, the, uh, the best selling like Hardy Boys like series, but set in uh, Rhodesia. Um, uh, like uh, he has to apologize because his grandparents weren't actually uh, white Rhodesian colonizers. He's he's, appropri- yeah. he's appropriating uh, you know real Rhodesians. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, to uh, round things out for today's episode, I have a uh, a reading series for you guys with once again an old favorite of the show. We haven't we haven't ch- we, I think we I don't think we've done one of these in a while, but it's you know s- s- you know the smartest journalist in the world, the smartest columnist in the world, Thomas Friedman. He's back again, and I'm proud to report. I mean, like you, you, he's been pretty boring lately, but he, he he's come through today with a real a real masterpiece of the craft of writing, thinking, and being Thomas Friedman. So you guys ready to jump into this one? It's uh, he, okay. He had lunch with President Biden. He had lunch with President Biden, and he regrets to he regrets to inform you that the lunch was great, but his vibes are bad. I mean, and by not Joe Biden's vibes, but uh, Thomas Friedman. He left this delicious lunch feeling bad vibes. So here we go. This is Thomas Friedman writing in the New York Times, My Lunch with President Biden. It's uh, the sequel to My Dinner with Andre. He says, President Biden invited me for lunch at the White House last Monday, but it was all off the record, so I can't tell you anything he said. Uh, the article ends there. It's just It was just that one paragraph, unfortunately. <laughs> he, can't, he can't tell you anything. Mm-hmm. No, no, he can't. He says, I can, though, tell you two things. What I ate and how I felt after. I ate a tuna salad sandwich with tomato on whole wheat bread with a bowl of mixed fruit and a chocolate milkshake for dessert that was so good it should have been against the law. Uh, How how would you rate that? How would you rate that lunch order, fellas? It's a Uh, fucking weird lunch. That's like, man, that's like, oh, we're letting the people in the psych ward pick their own lunch today. Seems very phlegmy. That's like that's like when Texas executes someone that they really shouldn't. You see their last meal. (laughs) It's like. Gummy bears and a can of Sprite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, for, like, okay, so he had fruit salad and a milkshake. Like, he had a he had a tuna salad sandwich. Tuna salad sandwich and fruit salad isn't that weird, I guess. But then it's like, oh, you know, would go great with this a chocolate milkshake. Yeah, the milkshake's mm. kind of out there. Well, you know, I mean, you gotta, have a, you gotta you're, you're at the White House. You gotta take advantage. You know, you gotta get a little just a little White House treat. You know, I, I would get a milkshake. I admire, I admire his restraint because if I went to the White House for a meal, I would assume that I'd have that prerogative where I could just order anything. Yeah, and I would I would go ham. Uh, so yeah, that, that was his lunch order. This is this is what he can. Report and when I say I would readers. go ham, I would say, do you have one of those uh, like articulated armatures that hold a hamon iberico haunch? <laughs> <laughs> could you boil one of those out here? They just have me slice off like nice thin bits <laughs> just, hamon just, iberico. <laughs> Maybe bring, wheel out some manchego for me to put it on. Ooh, yes. I would yes. show them. I would show them meals cooked by a certain Jamaican American content creator. <laughs> <laughs> the Secret Service would just draw down on you as yeah. soon as you pulled off the top. They would like light you up. Yeah, They'd dump be- eggs in you for presenting that to the president. I'd be like, uh, could the chef uh, please prepare a classic dish from New York City? Um, a steak bone in extra bone in fact uh with a slice of american cheese an entire rosemary plant five eggs and a bagel oh don't the bagel, the shell. One, one, don't forget the shell and the bagel has to have extra wet on it <laughs> that actually i bet that's like probably what biden would cook if you left him to his own devices yes yes uh yeah it's like uh, could you, I'm, I'm sorry just um i i i don't want to be a pain here but could you please send back my tuna salad sandwich and just could you just add a sprig of thyme and some eggshells on top of it please <laughs> just, 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 just a little extra flavor uh, uh, oh do you have any fish ever, man <laughs> you have any fish <laughs> this is the best movie ever man real men cook okay <laughs> uh, could you add any fish to this milkshake please uh yeah no so that was his lunch order but he says what i felt afterward was this for all you knuckleheads on fox on fox who say that biden can't put two sentences together here's a news flash he just put nato together europe together and the whole western alliance together stretching from canada up to finland and all the way to japan to help ukraine protect its fledgling democracy from vladimir putin's fascist assault so yeah like 
I know it may not seem like that way if you see him on television, but if you have lunch with him, uh, you'll notice he didn't say like, he didn't say that Biden can put two sentences together, nope. but he did say he did put, he did add Finland to NATO. It's amazing. He, he doesn't even intimate at any, like, he doesn't say he was sharp or no, articulate. No, no he, he doesn't. He doesn't say like, he could have certainly added some sort of like detail to reflect. Yeah. You know, the old guy has still got it. Couldn't bring himself to do it. Nope. He says, um, also, it, like, I mean, didn't like Putin really put NATO together? <laughs> it's like, true. If we're really being yeah, honest yeah. here, like, didn't, didn't true. Putin go, oh, uh, let's have 20 more years of NATO because I'm going to be dying next year. Enjoy. Yeah. yeah. If, if this was just on uh, on Biden, it would not have occurred. He needed he needed a, uh, a chef in the kitchen to help pop that one together. Yeah. Uh, he, got, he, goes, he writes, in doing so, he has enabled Ukraine to inflict significant losses on Russia's invading army thanks to a rapid deployment of U.S. and NATO trainers and, a, and massive transfers of precision weapons. And not a single American soldier was lost. But the I entire mean, <laughs> country has been turned into a bloody fucking stalemate. Uh, it has been the best performance of alliance management and consolidation since another president whom I covered and admired, who was also said to be incapable of putting two, sentence to two sentences together, George H.W. Bush. Bush managed the collapse of the Soviet Union and the reunification of Germany without firing a shot or the loss of a single American life. Now, I know George H.W. Bush is remembered for a lot of things or rather not remembered for them. But like, was he ever tagged as being inarticulate? I, he, tagged, he was tagged as being out of touch. And like, yeah, you know, no. he, well, yeah, he, was, he, he, he only had trouble putting sentences together when you asked him where he was in November of 1963. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, he did have a kind of rep for like kind of relying on sort of airy phrases and, and a lot of cliches, you know, not going to do it. A thousand anymore, points of light. He cert no one thought that he needed to have the clock test. No one was like, does George W. Bush know what day he's living in? As with, I mean, it's not comparable. I'm just, I just imagine giving like a cognitive test to Biden and asking him who's president right now. Like he just got out of a coma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has been. Okay, he goes. Uh, alas, though. Okay, so without firing a shot or the loss of a single American life. Alas, that we know of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Why do you? Yeah. Why do you think so many? Why do you think so many soldiers have been dying at Fort Bragg lately? Lately, I got news. For not, you, they, they probably didn't die in Fort Bragg. I mean, there's no way to know, is there? <laughs> They, they killed themselves because told they you? lost money on their black rifle coffee <laughs> stock. <laughs> uh, uh, here is the line of the article, though. This is a classic, classic bit of Thomas Friedman. He goes, alas, though, I left our lunch with a full stomach, but a heavy heart. That's that's the kind of fucking full writing. That's a heavy kind of, heart. <laughs> it's a oh, full don't stomach, go swimming, Tom. But a heavy full, heart. Full stomach, heavy heart, will lose. <laughs> <laughs> uh Biden didn't say it in so many words, but he didn't have to. <laughs> he didn't say it at all. He no. didn't say it in any words. He spoke no words. Uh, just an, an aide dabbing his mouth with a napkin after he finished his milkshake. Yeah, it's like Grandpa F Sawyer from Chainsaw Massacre getting wheeled out <laughs> to gnaw on the fucking uh, tri-tip. I just, I just lived out the entirety of the movie Big Fish with Joe Biden, but here's what he <laughs> said without saying it. Uh, I could hear it between the lines. He's worried that while he has reunited the West, he may not be able to reunite America. That, okay, that means that America is going to be reunited in like six months. <laughs> Division's over. <laughs> it's clearly his priority above any Build Back Better provision. And he knows that's why he was elected. A majority of Americans worried that the country was coming apart at the seams and that this old war horse called Biden, with his bipartisan instincts, was the best person to knit us back together. It's the reason he decided to run in the first place, because he knows that without some basic unity of purpose and willingness to compromise, nothing else is possible. But with every passing day, every mass shooting, every racist dog whistle, every defund the police initiative. Okay, like, record scratch? Like, okay, we're throwing like, uh, defund the police initiatives along with um, genocidal acts of terrorism. Uh, well, this also, is also, like, no one's done a defund the police thing since 2020. Like, every fucking, anywhere where Democrats do control, just like every week they pass, like, a non-binding resolution that they'll, like, raise the police budget every year. Yeah, like that. The, there's not. There aren't really even any voices within the like electoral structure of the Democratic Party that are even talking about that stuff anymore. At be, anywhere beyond the municipal level, 
Uh, it's yeah. And the places where they actually have power, Democrats, they've done it. Like that was, that was a 2020 thing. And I think you could argue that it was, you know, it was a branding issue for the Democrats, but the only people who are still talking about the fund, the police initiatives are Democrats complaining about them to obviate their own responsibility for why they're hated. Yeah. I, it like people really may have forgotten about it by now. If like every week Democrats weren't like, Oh, by the way, we, we hate to fund the police. Yeah. We're never doing that. Was it like uh, Amy Klobuchar the other day was like, I'm passing a resolution to honor the uh, 567 police officers who were, who died in the line of duty last year. But like, Something like 450 of them just died of COVID. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the uh, rest of them had, like had heart attacks at Wendy's. So like, yeah, this is, this is Thomas Friedman's sort of like laundry list of the things that are, you know, uh, rending America apart. So yeah, every mass shooting, every racist dog whistle, every defund the police initiative, every nation sundering Supreme Court ruling, every speaker run off campus, every bogus claim of election fraud. I wonder if he can bring us back together. I wonder if it's too late. So it's yeah. too late. Babe. Oh, it's too <laughs> well, late. I got to wonder. I mean, he probably does. Right. Because you don't get like this good on, if you don't like kind of believe it. Did he like really believe this stuff where Biden's like, oh, I'm going to like end division. I honestly I'm gonna think bring that America at, together. He, I he think that like at his did. level, guys like him, guys who have like been paid to have opinions their entire lives and never have to like have an unpleasant or adversarial encounter with anyone that they don't want to. I think that they have convinced themselves that that's true because yeah, I, what's it's motive. It's a motivated reasoning. It's, it's a way to stay fat and complacent. Yeah. It's yeah. No, no. Your fucking mustache all day. Yeah. No, I, I think he genuinely does believe it. And I think he also genuinely does believe on a certain level that like you can put things like a Milo Yabadabadopoulos getting yelled at on a college campus or like an activist, um, you know, promoting d defund the police or abolish the police at the same level of, you know, <laughs> ending ending the right to have an abortion or you know like i said genocidal acts of terrorist mass murder because I mean, like to, to have that job though like it's like you have to believe that everything has an equal and opposite reaction and that like right. if america if like america if people have lost their confidence in america or no one trusts each other it seems like our society is rapidly circling the drain blame has to be apportioned in a like reasonable both sides fashion right because like you 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 can recognize polarization, but you have to pretend that it's not an asymmetri asymmetrical polarization because that, that is, uh, in their minds, like uh, imposing uh, a values onto it, that you're not being an objective journalist. But, yeah. you know, there is an objective reality of the dynamics within the parties that is driving, driving both against one another, polarizing both. But in the case of the Democrats, the people doing this polarizing are the least powerful people within the greater coalition of like democratic voters and people who participated in politics as Democrats, like one way or the other, even if they hate the party, they vote for them. The least powerful people are doing the polarization. The Republican party's actual political infrastructure is completely controlled by people who are at the leading edge of the polarization. So it's a, it's a dynamic that has two halves, but is they're not equally uh, the, the, the power residing in the most, you know, uh, confrontational part of the coalition uh, is concentrated uh, uh, with the Republicans. And, but they can't they can't they can't do anything other than uh, uh, gesture at that. So he writes, <clears throat> I fear that we're going to break something very valuable very soon. And once we break it, it will be gone and we may never be able to get it back. Once we I break it, we buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I am talking about our ability to transfer power peacefully and legitimately, an ability we have demonstrated since our founding. The peaceful, legitimate mm -hmm. transfer of power is the keystone of American democracy. Break it, uh, and none of our institutions will work for long, and we will be thrust into political and financial chaos. I mean, yeah, un unlike now. <laughs> Seriously. I, 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 I'd hate to see what that would look like. I mean, it's very funny that he says that there's been this unbroken string of peaceful transfers of power forgetting the fucking civil war that was fought over the outcome of an election that was a kind of a big deal uh and then now you've got the fact that no election could really be said to be legitimate in the way he's pining for since 2000 because nope. 2000 is when all of these fucking things got broken 2000 smashed this fucking vase these assholes were the last people to notice because they didn't have to they're literally in a bubble at the ground though everyone new and that knowledge has just slowly been marching up 
uh, the, the capillaries of, of, uh, of society up to its upper reaches and now the very last people to get it are fucking dipshits like friedman but uh this has been knowledge on the street since 2000 that was that was like yeah you think that there's one way that we get uh, a president elected and we're gonna just in front of you show no that's not what does it and i think like that's probably like the exact same reason why for people like friedman or like anyone who's been writing about like the supreme court recently i think like they genuinely do believe that like uh, the the like the the terrible thing about Roe v. Wade being overturned is not the like severe abridgment of human rights it would mean for like half of the country, but it's that like the anger generated at the Supreme Court or like yeah. the, the loss of legitimacy You're undermining our in institutional the legitimacy. Yeah. Whereas like no. you know, with the Supreme Court decision in Bush v. Gore, I mean, like I said, from that moment on, like that, yeah. If you didn't realize that the Supreme Court was illegitimate, then then yeah, like I mean, th- these people are catching up to it now, but it's 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 the anger at the fact that we have a now more or less openly theocratic, um, ju- you know, like judicial branch of the, of the government, like the reality of that it, to, to people like Tom Friedman, who I'm sure is basically pro-choice and his personal beliefs in politics is entirely secondary to, um, the anger and uh, the anger directed at the court, like not at like the ruling itself, but at the court as an institution in American life that like should not have the authority that it does. Going on, he writes, uh, we are staring into that abyss right now because it is one thing to elect Donald Trump and pro-Trump, ca- pro-Trump candidates who want to restrict immigration, ban abortions, slash corporate taxes, pump more oil, curb sex education in schools, and liberate citizens from more mask mandates in a pandemic. Those are policies where there can be legitimate disagreement, which is the stuff of politics. But the recent primaries and investigations around the January 6th inter- insurrection at the Capitol are revealing a movement by Trump and his supporters that is not propelled by any coherent sense of policies, but rather by a gigantic lie that Biden did not freely and fairly win the majority of electoral college votes and therefore is an illegitimate president. Thus, their top priority is installing candidates whose primary allegiance is to Trump and his big lie, not to the Constitution. And they are more than hinting that in any close election in 2024, or even ones that aren't so close, they would be willing to depart from established constitutional rules and norms and award that election to Trump or other Republican candidates who didn't actually garner the most votes. They are not whispering this platform, they are running for office on it. In short, we are seeing a national movement that is telling us publicly and loudly, we will go there. And that terrifies me because, in all caps, I have been there. My formative experience in journalism was watching Lebanese politicians go there in the late 1970s and plunge their frail democracy into a protracted civil war. So don't tell me that it can't happen here. Not when people like Pennsylvania State Senator Doug Mastriano, an election denier who marched through the January 6th crowd at the Capitol, just won the GOP primary to run for governor. Have no doubt, these people will never do what Al Gore did in 2000. Okay, I'll stop you right there. They would never do what Al Gore did in 2000, and that's why they're winning and will continue right, to win. because they think fucking, there's actually yeah. stakes involved. <laughs> yes. Talk about no one wants to work anymore. This sucks. <laughs> this is so fucking boring. Holy shit. Like it's it, it's like he, I feel like he used to be more interesting. He used to use I know better, he's a, yeah. more he used to use more and better hilarious metaphors. That's for sure. Yeah, god damn, he is phoning it in. You know, uh, like, a, like 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 say that everyone say that everyone is like caught in the well of a uh, malaise. You know, say 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 we're we're trapped in the the, the quicksand of non voting. Say that we we fell into the chocolate river from Willy Wonka of national division this is just like there are 50 other articles that are like this he's he, he, lost it he doesn't give a shit anymore it's sad <laughs> no you're right like with with his uh his 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 penchant for metaphors he used to be like the like he used to be like the little carmine of columnists like he would always come out with some real shit like you know we're at the crossroads of a great precipice or something like that well yeah but with like the real hook to him like the only thing I like really did find interesting about him is that he always sounded like the most crackhead way of going like, oh, here's why like everything that's happening is fine. Hmm. Like it, it is kind of funny to write a column every week for like 20 years and your only opinion is like most things are fine. Yeah, Th- that is pretty interesting. But Everything's just, moving like, in a good direction. You yeah, everything. Out. Everything's good. But that like. I, I I I like I get it. Like yeah, the uh, theocracy uh, bad, institutions failing, democracy in danger. Uh what are you going to do? Write more articles? I don't care. Well, I mean I mean I do like I care about the stuff that's happening, but it's like you don't seem to have any ideas. 
I, I'd well, be more interested if you were like, uh, this is bad, but most things are fine, and here's why. Yeah, we're gonna I mean, make we're gonna make Doug Mastriano watch Frasier. I think everybody at every level of political commentary, from us on up to Friedman, is trying to reckon with the challenge of uh, articulating like a political moment where there is no reason to believe that there can be any like effective mass action to prevent what's coming, right? Like that is a everyone has that belief now at every level. Uh, and it's only a question of like, how do they come to terms with it? And like, you can either do what we're, I think, trying to do, which is, you know, maybe not, uh, accept basically the premise that, you know, the political moment seems to have passed, but this is what is actually occurring, you know, like as close as we can understand it, as opposed to people like Friedman who are so close to actual power that they feel the need to absolve them of responsibility. Yeah. Right. Like the highest levels. So like what he's saying is kind of what we're saying. It's like, yeah, this is happening and nothing can really change it. But he wants to, for example, blame the far left of the Democratic Party, right? He wants to mm -hmm. say, we could stop these guys, but it's these people won't let us. And they have no power over them. They can't. They, and all they can do is what they have been doing, which is tell them to stop. Well, that hasn't worked. We have no plan to make it more effective of a pitch. So unless they turn around on their own, it won't be our fault even though they're the actual ones in actual power. Well, I mean, to, to that point, Matt, I'll, I'll just read the end of the uh, this, this very boring column. But uh, just get the end of it. He says, <clears throat> Biden is not blameless in this dilemma, nor is the Democratic Party, particularly its far left wing. Under pressure to revive the economy and facing big ticket demands from the far left, Biden pursued expansive spending for too long. House Democrats also sullied one of Biden's most important bipartisan achievement, a giant infrastructure bill, by making it hostage to other excessive spending demands. The far left also saddled Biden and every Democratic candidate with radical notions like defund the police, an insane mantra that would have harmed the black and Hispanic base of the Democratic Party had it been implemented. To defeat Trumpism, we need, say, only 10 percent of Republicans to abandon their party and join with a center left Biden, which is what he was elected to be and still is at heart. But we may not be able to get even one percent of Republicans to shift if far left Democrats are seen as defining the party's future. And that is why I left my lunch with the president with a full stomach, but a heavy heart. Um, I love that his editor at The New York Times let him use that phrase twice. He, he, they, they thought that bar was fire and they were like, just yeah. bring it back at the end. Bring it back at the end, Thomas. But like his pitch is like even his best case scenario pitch of what to do to beat this is just what they have been doing and what lost them the presidency in 2016 remember that when they this was the strategy every they, they, they the explicit strategy of course you can always blame the far left but the thing once again if they're already gonna always gonna be there and you can't stop them from you know being uh uh extremists then the things that have happened in the past will continue to happen in the future and you cannot be you are not offering an actual plan. You are offering an excuse. And it's like, that's one thing for us to do, you know, at the, down here in the podcast minds. But it's something else entirely for the actual administration and it's like direct media handmaidens to do. Uh, when they're the ones who actually, you know, are in the White House. <laughs> uh, Matt, I, do, what I, I, I do like, I do feel like bad for him because it is kind of like, what, what do you write? You know? Yeah. Cause, cause if you have to keep the right, right. Pollyanna bullshit up, and a, you run out of stuff fast. Right. Well, Joe got in there and it's like, oh, he's the best at shaking hands. He's going to get this done. Oh, it looks <laughs> like Joe didn't get it done. Oh, yeah. uh, every, look, look, everything continues to crumble. Well, if you're Thomas Friedman, you can't do a movie episode. We can't. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that is one thing we have on him. Yep. Top, Gun, Top Gun Maverick coming out. Coming yeah. out this weekend, baby. Let's go. Oh, baby. He How is the danger zone? He doesn't yeah. get anything like that. He can't do any of that. Like when we're. Like, I'll be honest, like the Biden news cycle is fucking tough. It is like yeah, it's brutal. what I imagine doing this podcast would have been like in 1989. Like, yeah. it, it is. It is just like uh, the, the substitute is out. They have wheeled the TV out of class. There's a, there's, <laughs> a, you know, it, it just we're, we're doing a version of McLaughlin group where no one believes in God. Sometimes that's what it feels like with this news. But. <laughs> We oh, we have those aces in our pocket. It's like, oh, we can look up, you know, we can do an episode about like, yeah, Navy SEALs or like um, a movie or, you know, 
I could interview a disgraced governor. But if, if you're <laughs> if, if you're Thomas Friedman, it's like every single week you've got to write about this bullshit. And at this point, like you've done everything. Like you, you're like, oh, I I could write about how I saw a Kinkos in the Maldives. No, you did that ten years ago. <laughs> oh, I can I, I can write about how like uh, the new business traveler voter. You've done that thirty <laughs> times. Oh, I can I I can I, I can write about the lacrosse election. No, you've done that. So you just you just got to do this like shitty news, and that now it's like he he's in the quicksand of malaise. I think he I gotta say have... I would like to hear what uh, Thomas Friedman had have to say about the Franklin credit scandal. <laughs> That'd be interesting. <laughs> Most things are fine. <laughs> Uh, the fact that I, William, the fact that William Casey t- could kill himself this way shows that well, we have me. active seniors in this country. <laughs> I know it's cold. Dude. The fact uh, that a man that old could be canoeing. <laughs> I think. I mean, like, look. So Frank Bruni made the transition from food columnist to opinion columnist. I think fucking Friedman should just go in the opposite direction. I just want to yes. hear what kind of lunches he's having around DC. Give me the it's rundown. True. Just, just get, get the New York Times needs to have, like on its website or something, like just like lunch chat, like boys chat, where everyone just just is like, yo, hey Kings, check out this burger I'm having. It's just, <laughs> it's just be, it's just be DC burger chat. What kind of burgers are you having? What were the fries like? A uh, tomato on burger, yay or nay? Let's get this debate started. <laughs> you know what? I would actually, I would think I would check that out. That sounds like it would be a fun, especially like if you lived in the city or you were visiting it. It also is like a little impromptu guide to w- w- where to get the good grub. I love it. Well, that that's like, yeah. I mean, every lunch, every chat really has to have the one guy who's posting <laughs> the most gruesome <laughs> food of all time. That I could think, be Thomas would, Friedman for America. It might be Thomas, but it's like Thomas is married to like a mall billionaire. So, you know, he's like going to the most insane food courts in the world. Um <laughs> I think it's like, like Frank Bruni has the vibe of someone who's always just posting like a miserable bowl. <laughs> I think he would be sort of the object of scorn in that group chat. I would like to see Thomas Friedman's like a uh, uh, gold flake covered Sabaro from the Dubai airport. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, like, like I said, I, I think he I think his job gives him access to some very interesting lunch and lunch spots. And I think that's the direction he needs to go in. Just just tell us what you're eating, King. Sound off in the chat, and like, and let's get just get in, like instead of talking about you know like oh like the uh, far left is hampering the Democrats' ability to get ten percent of Republican voters. Now fuck that. Just start an interminable debate about barbecue, about barbecue wet food. Absolutely, mustard, dry rub. What are your thoughts? Yeah, hit us Thomas, up in the comments. Th- Thomas, you, there is a secret. It's a secret to living, to you know being alive in this awful, scary time. A secret to a human dignity. Uh, how have all these people on Twitter, all of them, who their minds, the world, possibly their friends and family, they're all telling them to kill themselves. How have they not <laughs> done it by pretending that they have really vociferous opinions on food and arguing about it all the time on Twitter? Mm-hmm. You can you, you can get out there and be like, oh, if, if you like St. Louis barbecue, blah, 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 blah. That could be a great use of your time, and it could, more importantly, keep you from killing yourself at one of your wife's sharper images. <laughs> it keep you from sticking your head in a massage chair you and just, lo- just putting it on a forbidden high, highest setting until your brain liquefies. <laughs> just locking your- suicide by mall cop. Yeah, <laughs> I love. I love the idea of him committing like mall, like doing a Benoit thing, but with the mall stuff, L- locking like yourself. He- in- <laughs> locking yourself in a tanning bed until you die of cancer he like takes the like a seat like the auntie Anne's like pretzel gun and just shoots it into his mouth until it shoots his organs out of his asshole <laughs> oh he, he like pretzeled his organs out of his body <laughs> getting the getting beheaded with like one of the dull swords from the mall sword shop <laughs> <laughs> setting yourself on fire in front of a hot topic <laughs> Yeah, just choking like, yourself just, to death on the uh, penis-related paraphernalia from Spencer's <laughs> gifts. Just try to cut your own head off through paper cuts with the Tony Robbins book from Brookstone. Uh, well, there we go. For uh, well, because for, for Thomas Friedman and everyone reading the New York Times, uh, Matt, 
what what was Cameron Diaz's last line from Cormac McCarthy's The Counselor, the last line of that movie? Oh, yes, yes. She says, uh, uh, there's nothing crueler than a coward. And the slaughter to come is prob- will probably be beyond our imagining. Till next time, guys. Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye. It's, bye bye. It's fine. the big chapo. <laughs> Gentle lace. Okay. Gentle lace. All right. Bye, everybody. Oh, Goodbye, baby. <laughs>